how to please God is our subject this evening. This is number eight in a series of messages designed for those of you who are young Christians. I've told you how to be sure whether you're a Christian or not. I've told you how to tell others that you've become a Christian. We've learned about how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to enjoy church. We know now that we can know what is right. We learned last week how to resist temptation. Tonight we come to how to please God and you'll see the introduction on the sheet straight away. We're to please God all the time, friends. Now if you really are a Christian, of course, you want to please God. You look at the cross, you remember the tremendous sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that you would be lost tonight. You would be without God, you would be without hope. And everything's changed because of the blood of Christ. And you want to please God because of the great sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ by which you've been brought back to God. One of the things that Paul prayed constantly for young Christians is that they would learn to please God. The first reference on our sheet is there, isn't it? Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. And he says that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. So I want you to live and behave like Christians. And I want you to please God fully. Not just in some parts of your life, not just in other parts of your life, but in every part of your life I'm praying that you'll please God, says the Apostle. And there's something similar at the end of Hebrews, there in Hebrews 13, 21. Again, it's a prayer. And it goes like this. May the God of peace make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. I don't know if you pray for the young Christians of the church, do you? I don't know if you young Christians pray for each other, do you? One thing we should all pray for everybody is that we should learn to please God. Now, general rules we've had. We've had those in previous weeks. We still need special help in particular areas. So what we're going to do tonight is go through a typical day and we're going to see that in a typical day or in a typical week we have to be Christians in five different areas. Now when you wake up in the morning, where are you? If you're like me, you sometimes wonder where you are. You're at home. There is a way of pleasing God at home. It's spelled out for us in Ephesians 5. Please have that open. And it's also spelled out for us in Colossians 3. So please have that open too. Each person in the family has a key word. Each person in the family has a specific role. It's not up to me to say to anybody else in my family, you should be doing that. But it is up to me to say God speaks to me through his word and this is what I'm to do. It's too easy to keep tabs on others and remind them of their responsibilities. The Bible says, face your own. The Bible speaks to wives first, Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Colossians 3.18 Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, ladies, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to be Christian or worldly. Are you going to listen to the TV and the radio? Well, listen to them by all means. But are you just going to swallow what they say? Are you going to swallow what the peer pressure of those around you is saying to you? Or will you now stop this evening and listen to God who speaks to you through the scripture? The secret of happy families is submissive wives. Not doormats. Not second class citizens in the kingdom of God. Not inferior people. 
But submissive wives, submission being in the Bible simply this, everything I have and everything I am is at the disposal of somebody else. A submissive wife is a Christian woman and everything she has and everything she is is at the disposal of her husband, her intuition, her opinions, her wisdom, her experience, her education, her skills, her energy, everything that makes her into the glorious creature that she is, is at the disposal of her husband. Submissive wives, husbands, Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Colossians 3.19 Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. You would think that if the wife has to submit, the husband would be told to rule. But he isn't. No husband's told to rule. His wife He's told to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church by giving himself because all he was interested in was the good of the church. A loving husband is a man who all he wants is the good and the welfare of his wife and he will give himself whatever the sacrifice if it's in her interest and he will never be bitter toward her. In the harmony of that marital relationship, now in the home there are children. Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It doesn't say when they're right. This is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Colossians 3.20 Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. There's the word, pleasing. Obedience is doing what lawful authority says at once. Now, in a friendly way, but in a frank way, I must speak to some of the mums and dads. Some of you do not insist upon the immediate obedience of your children. That is a great crime that you're committing against your boys and girls. God insists that they learn to obey you at once, straight away, no questions. If you've got a proper bedtime system in your home, of course, and they they want to complain uh, about the discipline and the order of the home, they will have that opportunity when you sit on their bed at night and talk to them and pray with them and ask them about their preoccupations and their complaints. But children must learn to obey fully at once. Only such children ever grow up to be morally strong because they do a thing not because it pleases them, but because God-ordained authority has said it is to be done. Now, of course, there are no small children in the church this evening, they're in the children's evening service. The principle of honouring your father and mother still remains, young people. And if what your parents are asking you to do is right, then you must do it. If there's a clear conflict, of course, between what they're saying and Christ demands, at your age you may have to make some difficult decisions. But generally speaking, you must accept the fact that immediately, without question, you're going to do what mum and dad say. Because that's the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you. You can see already that most of the tensions of a home would be over if these glorious commands of, the, of a wise God were obeyed and family life would be pleasing. But there's one more thing to say and it's to fathers Ephesians 6 4 because fathers are the authority over the children in the home mother becomes the authority when father is not there and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath 
but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And Colossians 3.21 Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. A Christian man isn't a man who's heavy-handed, who bounces in and throws his weight around. He is firm, but he is gentle. He insists, but not in such a way as to humiliate. He does not provoke to wrath, because there is a divine, godly way of acting as a man in a family. In scripture, to be gentle is to be great. That's how we please God at home. There's God's plan for the family. When the plan is not kept, the family begins to break up. Where the plan is kept, happy homes are found. We must not point the finger, not for me to wake up in the morning and say, this is what you should do. It's for me to wake up in the morning to say, this is what I should do. And for each one to take seriously what God says to him or to her. The second great area is work. Not everybody has work, unfortunately. But the Bible constantly says we must seek work and work. So we go now to what the scriptures say about people at work. Now in the early world there were slaves. They had to work. For the most part they received little or no wages. And they lived under a tyranny which you and I will never experience under any employer in this country, probably. But this is what God's word says to such people in worse conditions than anybody here will ever face. Ephesians 6, 5 Servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleases, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord, and not to men. Colossians 3.22 Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Live in your university, college, school, factory, office, tomorrow you knew that the Lord Jesus Christ was waiting for you what difference would it make would you be punctual or late or early would you work well or would it be an up and down affair would you say of a piece of work that'll do or would you seek excellence would you clock off early or extend the lunch hour or give a full, full day's work would you be well turned out now of course the scripture doesn't teach that people have got to go to work dressed in any particular way Christians don't have to wear Homburg hats Max with belts suits and all the rest they may, their profession may require that but if you're wearing jeans I'm not convinced that scripture would permit you to wear dirty jeans if you've got a shirt that needs repairing it would be a good Christian witness would it not for it to be repaired wouldn't that be a better way a better recommendation of the gospel of Christ in a given situation if Jesus Christ was the employer wouldn't you be well turned out and wouldn't you take your stand when they joke about that? Would you not just perhaps remove yourself but take a stand 
And when there was a clear witness to the truth, such as a Bible study or some other clear gathering of Bible-believing Christians, wouldn't you be there if Jesus Christ was your employer? And wouldn't you be a friend to all and a soul winner? But, says Paul, he is there. And we learn to please the Lord at work by remembering that he is the ultimate employer. All of us live among our neighbours. Let's go to number three. Jesus Christ himself spoke about this question of neighbours. Neighbours is not the name of a soap. Not in the Bible. What is a neighbour? Luke chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 25. Please follow the reading. You know it already, but let's see if we can refresh our minds again. Because here our Lord speaks directly to this question of how to live in a neighbourhood. What is a neighbour? Who is a good neighbour? Who is my neighbour? How could I be his neighbour? Luke 10, we'll start in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbour? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite when he arrived at the place came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was and when he saw him he had compassion on him and went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbour to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Now people often ask the question, verse 36, how come it's talking about three? Because really there are only two points of view. You've got a priest and a Levite who seem to have the same point of view. Well, I think it's obvious if you reread it, but the word three is important because there are three philosophies, three ways of thinking in this parable. There are thieves, and they say, what's yours is mine, I'll take it. That's not being a neighbour. And then there's the priest and the Levite, and they say, what's mine's mine, I'll keep it. That's not being a neighbour. And then there's a Samaritan who says, what's mine, yours, I'll share it, I'll give it. That's being a neighbour. Did you notice the key words? He went to him, he saw him, he had compassion on him, he went to him, he took care of him. What are we told by the Lord Jesus Christ to do? In two sentences we're told to do this. We are told to notice need, not to close our eyes to it, not to pretend that it hasn't happened, to notice it. Now the need in your 
road or street may not be someone who's been mugged like this poor man. But there are all sorts of needs in the people who live around us. All sorts. There are hidden needs and the worst needs are hidden, you know. And the worst tears are the ones you don't see. We are to notice need. There are some people who are paining and hurting but we're not close enough to them to see the pain or to hear the cry. But we are to notice need. And when we've noticed it, we do what we can about it. We help those in need. That's what a Christian is to do. That's what it is to be a neighbour. That's how we please the Lord as we live amongst unconverted people every day. What needs are there in your school? What needs are there in your office? What needs are there in your road or street? At home, at work, among your neighbours, number four, in your spare time. How can I please God? You will remember from a previous message, perhaps, that we worked out that the average British person, when everything else has been done, washed, shaved, worked, travelled, has about 35 hours of spare time per week. You can tell what sort of Christian a person is by seeing how he uses his spare time. For if God has got hold of your time, it's certain he's got hold of you. When Paul writes to the Ephesians, there it is again, he tells them that they are to be men and women who are redeeming the time or buying it up, making the most of it. The difference between a Christian who is mediocre, ordinary, and a Christian who is making his mark is almost always in the different use of time. Some of you here are very well off and some of you are not. Some of you are extremely talented and some of you feel that you are not so talented. But we all have 24 hours in a day. And for the most part, we all have a certain amount of spare time. And the real difference in life will be seen, not so much in your intellect or talent, but in what you did with your spare time. Do you use it? Do you use it in the best possible way? Does it serve some purpose? Or is it wasted, squandered? Are you one of those Christians who has nothing to do? Isn't that a pathetic thing to say? In this great world of need, where millions of people are perishing because they've no knowledge of the gospel, in this great world of need, with all the crime and agony and suffering and want, in this great world of need, with hunger at home and abroad, and a thousand, thousand things pressing themselves in on us, how can any Christian ever say, I've nothing to do? Here are some hints on redeeming the time. Get alone with God. Decide what regular things you should do each week. And do them. There's some Christian work you should be doing. But perhaps you could advance your education. Help that neighbour. And there are so many other positive, real, valuable things that could be done. Take your week into the presence of God and ask him and think it through what you should do each week and stick to it. Commit yourself to it. I used to have a great aunt. She was a rather eccentric woman, but she had a weekly timetable. And wild horses wouldn't drag her off that weekly timetable. Monday morning saw her up at four. She had the records blue, if you remember that, some of you. And the washboard. And the washing was in at a certain hour. The copper was put on at a certain hour. Young people don't know what I'm talking about. And the washing was out by a certain time. And certain days in the week and certain times in the week were for ironing. And this and that and the other. And it was all timetabled. And it was a bondage beyond belief. I'm not asking for that. 
because there was no flexibility if you called at a moment when she, the copper should be switched on or it was time to make the weekly cake you were unwelcome we're not asking for that we're asking nonetheless that we should discipline our time no Christian should ever go to bed without having a fairly good idea what he will do if the Lord spares him tomorrow Sunday should not break without you having a fairly good idea what you will do throughout the week and of course there will be helpful leisure and physical exercise and other things which keep our whole mind balanced in that program but the time is not ours it's time which God gave to us but we must use it well that's how we please God at home, at work, among our neighbours, in our spare time. But there's one other issue which I'll cover before we finish. How can I please God with my money? You can please God with your money by remembering that you don't have any. No Christian anywhere has any money of his own. Let's go to the Old Testament and look at a remarkable prayer. If an Old Testament believer could speak like this, how much more should we? We go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Here gifts are being given so that the temple can be built. The gifts are being given to David so that Solomon, his son, can build the temple. David is astonished by the generosity of the gifts which he now presents to the Lord. So here is a man coming in prayer to God with great riches. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 10 Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours let's underline that first all that is in heaven and in earth is yours yours is the kingdom O Lord and you are exalted as head over all both riches and honour come from you riches come from you and you reign over all in your hand is power and might, in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. As a Christian man or woman, you don't have a pound or a penny that didn't come to you from God. It is the Lord's so budget it how can you manage somebody else's money if you don't budget it how can you check unnecessary spending of somebody else's money if you don't budget it and shame of shames how can you stop falling into debt because debt is forbidden in the word of God without budgeting your money here is a suggestion keep a record of what comes in a written record write it down write down the blessing what is your income where did it come from write it down it's a blessing from God Keep a record of it. You believe it's from God? 
then do what the scripture has always done. If you believe it's from God, demonstrate that fact by immediately setting aside one-tenth for the work of the gospel and for the godly poor. Now what to do with the rest? Now put aside enough money to meet your regular obligations. You've got a mortgage to pay or rent, housekeeping, Eat and light, water, council tax, how modern this sermon is. Insurances, travel, clothes, telephone, TV license, car tax. Well, somebody says, I haven't got enough money for all that. Then there's a few things you can take off that list, aren't there? You take the car off, couldn't you? And the car tax. And you could take the TV off and the TV license. And there are other things that could be taken off. You can take the telephone off, you can live without some of these things. There's some things you can't live without. If you can't afford it, you can't have it biblically. So you must meet your definite obligations because debt is forbidden. Legal debt is permitted. That's where a debt has been arranged beforehand before you enter into it, like a mortgage. But debt, which you've just taken upon yourself, is not permitted in the word of God. God forbids it. Now put aside a definite sum to save. If it's a pound a month, put a definite sum aside. Get into the discipline. And if there's anything left, there are two key words. They're on the sheet. Finally, ask the Lord to help you spend what remains. And here are the two words unselfishly because it's not my money it's his now of course Christian liberty gives us the, the privilege of buying things and enjoying things for ourselves because he gives us all things richly to enjoy but the key word still remains unselfishly because self-indulgence just feeding our own appetite and greed ruins spiritual life and responsibly Maybe that money could be put to a better use at this particular time. It can't be spent without thought. I often meet Christians in debt. I often meet Christians in deep financial trouble. I have not yet met a Christian who kept to this advice who ended up in that mess. You can please God, you see. Some people think the Christian life is prayer and Bible study and church meetings. Those are the things which feed the Christian life, as I keep saying. But the Christian life is living at home. It's being a Christian at work. Being a Christian in a given road or neighbourhood. It's being a Christian in the evening and at spare time and on the weekend. It's being a Christian in the way that I earn my money and the way I spend it. And Christ is and can be pleased in all these areas. So we take it all up together and we say with Paul we make it our aim to be well pleasing to him for we must all appear before the judgment seat not of this church not of each other we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ Christ